So, <clears throat> excuse me, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and to be thankful. Will you please pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you again for a wonderful sunny day, allowing all of us to gather, celebrate you, your word, your name, and your son, as long as everybody is happy and healthy. Amen. seated. We wanted to welcome the Reverend Don and Gwen Cramblett to our worship service this morning. Don is a Timothy of this congregation. He is uh, retired now. They live in Colorado Springs. But if you knew him from years past, you uh, might find a moment to greet him this morning. So Don, thank you very, very much for being here. And Gwen, have you ever had a friend or even a family member who uh, you didn't get around to talking to for a while and then that little while turned into a longer while and before you know it it got into be such a long period of time that you were very very embarrassed almost too embarrassed to talk with them to call them well we get that way sometimes with our God in terms of our prayers I think. The days just sort of flow together and flow by and before we know it we'll notice that several days have gone by and we have not prayed. Or maybe several weeks have gone by and we have not prayed. We can't let that happen. We need God's touch and God's ears spiritually for ourselves. And we are obligated with the people that we should be praying for. They need the touch of God, and we need to ask. We've got a variety of people, the victims in Turkey and Syria still, the, the folks dealing with this winter storm who weren't ready, uh, Gene Smith health issues, uh, Raylene Rouse's brother, Sean, uh, Kim Renault's prayers for her mother, uh, James and Kaylee, their Aunt Maria. The list, is, uh, the list is long enough that it'll keep you busy. You all have people, your own people, that you need to pray for. Grandchildren, children, great-grandchildren, friends, neighbors, kids, parents. We need to pray for them. When you receive this list in the mail, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or email tomorrow, Please kick your prayer life back in gear. You need to speak to and to hear from the Lord. 
and the Lord needs to hear from you. Will you bow your heads with me? Our loving God, we present ourselves to you. A group of believers who are seeking to find the way. A group of believers who get uh, surprisingly comfortable in whatever position we are in our faith walk. Even though you instruct us scripturally that we ought to be moving forward, we need to grow. We need to evolve. We need to become more the people you need us to be for the benefit of your kingdom on earth. Lord, we present ourselves to you with all our weaknesses and all of our sins. We ask that through your mercy you forgive us, that you help us see a better path, and we ask that you give us the strength and the wisdom and the motivation to walk where you lead us. All this we ask in the, in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Will the kids come up for the children's sermon, please? I'm giving each of you a piece of paper. Has anybody ever given you a piece of paper before? Yeah. Yeah, no. Okay. This morning, our job from up here is to get our piece of papers as far down the aisle as we can get them. You can do it any way you want with your paper. Any questions? No questions? Anybody have any ideas? Paper airplane, that's interesting. That might go further than that. You can, if you want to make a paper airplane behind you on the, uh, go ahead. Anyway, all of you, go ahead, do whatever you need to do to get your paper from here as far down the aisle as you can. Go ahead. That's a problem. Ugh. Oh, try again. I always make them by folding it in half this way. And then fold it down this way on both sides and then do it one or two more times. You guys can come clear up here to throw them. Whoa, that's good. That's the winner. We got to put that out here where it is. So far. Oh. Pardon? Oh, yes. You just talk amongst yourselves. I think it, that, that ought to work. See how it'll go. Just up to the front of the pews. Watch your eyes, people in the audience. How did it work? Really? How'd that happen? Uh, you got to throw them higher. Oh, okay. It's hard. I don't think we have time. Those people out there are getting bored. Yeah, oh, you mean go get it and throw it again? Sure. If you want. Try that. And by the way, I've always been particularly bad at making paper airplanes. Yeah.
Okay. Oh, wait, now, kids, I have a question. Now, I'll leave the paper airplane for later. Any, any? You'll have to ask somebody who knows more about them than me. Any other ideas about how we could have gotten our paper further down the aisle? Yes, sir. You can throw it with all your might, but I'm afraid paper wads are hard to throw. Any other ideas? Yes, sir. That's right. Aim it high, and then the paper airplane will go down. Anything else? Well, what if we just did this? Would that get the paper further down the aisle? Well, yes, it would. Look. I know, but I know nobody ever said we couldn't do that. <laughs> this morning, I want you all to think about possibilities. Do you know what God wants from you and me and all of them? God wants us to watch for possibilities. Watch for some place, some person who needs a little bit of help. Watch for somebody who needs a smile or a thank you or a please or an I love you. Watch for them. We got to watch for them. And when we see them, we got to think how best in the name of Jesus we can tell them that they're, that they're important. That's our job, you and me and them. We have to watch for possibilities when we can be really nice to somebody because God loves us. Any questions? If you want, you can pick up your wads of paper and keep them, but you don't have to. Thanks for coming up. <coughs> yeah, later. Pardon? Okay.
Greg, does that music have a date on it when it was written? Nineteen sixty five. I remember the first time I heard that that music. It was at church camp in Colorado. And I was a high school kid. And that the words of that movie touched uh, the words of that song touched me really, really deeply. I mean, it's a powerful song, peace. Let it begin with me. If uh, you have time, look it up sometime and read it. It's uh, That's a great song. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Linda. John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. When Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not him, would not entrust himself to them. Because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. The scripture passage reports something that happened very early in the ministry of Jesus. Now, we aren't told what wonders or miracles or signs Jesus performed in Jerusalem during that Passover festival. But it's evident that Jesus did some miracles because it says in verse 23, many believed in him as they saw the miracles he performed. So, all those people believing in Jesus because of the miracles he performed, was that a problem? It kind of doesn't seem like it would be to me, but it evidently was to him. Evidently, it is a problem for Jesus. Here's how our passage reads in today's New English Version. While Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in him as they saw the miracles he performed. But Jesus did not trust himself to them because he knew them all. There was no need for anyone to tell him about them because he himself knew what was in their hearts. By looking at this picture, this, these pictures, can you tell me anything about these folks? I mean, just by looking at someone, can you tell them, tell me about them? Can you tell me what's in their heart or in their mind or in their history? But what do you think Jesus could tell about these people or about you people? The scripture passage says that our Lord and Savior knows us, knows what we're thinking knows what's in our hearts, what we're feeling. Do you think Jesus knew what these people would become? Could Jesus see what was in their minds, what, what they were considering? How well did Jesus know them? Or more importantly today, how well does Jesus know you? Jesus knew human nature. He knew that there were many of these who said they believed in him who just wanted to see more miracles. They wanted him to turn his power against the Roman Empire and and free Judea. They wanted Jesus to to do healings and, and miracles and great wonders for them to watch for the benefit of the people who wanted to witness his power. And they would have followed him. He knew that. They would have followed him. They would have declared him king and followed him as long as the wonders and the miracles and the signs continued. But tell me, do you think they would have followed him when he started about being of service to other people? When he started teaching about how they were supposed to treat other people the way they wanted to be treated, about self-denial so poor people could be cared for, about surrendering, (laughs) excuse me, surrendering, surrendering their will and control of their lives to God? Do you think those people would have continued to follow Jesus? Would they have stuck with him as he's talking about carrying a cross or about the way he'd have to face death in order to rise from the grave and and save people from their sins? Do you think the people who wanted to see another miracle would have followed Jesus when he was arrested and tried and crucified? No. Jesus knew them. 
He knew they would give up on his teachings as soon as they realized it was going to take work. And it was going to require that they change their lifestyles. And it was going to require a whole new list of priorities. Jesus didn't trust himself to them because they didn't want what he wanted. And that brings up a hard question for you and me. Do you and I want what Jesus wants? William Barclay wrote, it's a great characteristic of Jesus that he did not and does not want followers unless they clearly understand and specifically accept what's involved in following him. Jesus refused to cash in on his popularity that came about because of the miracles he performed. Jesus refused to ask people to follow him until they fully understood the cost fully understood what Jesus is asking. So think of all the people, all the people then, all the people now. No one could know what might be in their hearts, just like you and me. Nobody knows what's going through our heads. Nobody knows what's going through the deepest of our feelings, but Jesus did and Jesus does. Jesus knew that even his most faithful followers would crowd to be with him until things got really rough, and then they'd slip away, and they'd leave him alone. Jesus knows how fickle human nature can be, but he also knew what great things persons, people could accomplish. Jesus was doing great signs and miracles. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever wondered why, especially in the early part of his ministry, he did all these signs and miracles? Was it to attract those people that wouldn't stick with him anyway? I don't think so. In each healing and in each miracle, Jesus gave us a glimpse into the heart and the mind of God. Now pause for a minute and think about that statement that in each of his signs, Jesus was giving us a glimpse into the heart and mind of of God. Could that be true? Not only did Jesus show compassion and sympathy and love for the young couple getting married, remember? For when the wine ran out at their reception, Jesus miraculously created water or created from water new wine to save that young couple from community embarrassment. In the actions of Jesus, do we see the compassion and the sympathy and the love of God? Can you see through the actions of Jesus the the pain that our God must feel when when one of us is hurting? Just as the officials pain uh, moved from moved Jesus to heal the man's son and the official said to Jesus sir come down before my little boy dies and in Jesus response do we see the mind and the heart of God and the lame man in chapter 5 of John's gospel what can we learn about the heart and the mind of God when Jesus said to the lame man do you want to be made well When Jesus asked if we want to be made well, when we go to God in prayer asking in desperation that God might step in and help, help us or bless someone we love, when, when we find ourselves in some situation from which we cannot pull ourselves, when we witness Jesus reaching out to help people, does that give us an example of what's going, th- what's going through God's heart and mind about our own troubles? The scriptures tell us that we have been created in God's image. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. Genesis 127. You are created in the image of God. And listen to what Jesus says about our creator, our great God in the gospel of John. Jesus said, and whoever sees me sees him who sent me. In John's 14th chapter, the the apostle Philip is trying to understand and says, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And then Jesus clarifies once again, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The point being made 
is that if we pay attention to Jesus, we will come to better know God. If you want to better know God, then learn more about Jesus. If you would like to better know God, then the best way to accomplish that is to get better to get to better know Jesus. Now, there's just one more thing that we need to pay special attention to in this little passage from John's sermon, and you can see that I'm almost at the end. Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone. For he himself knew what was in everyone. Jesus knew the people of his day. Jesus knew their thoughts and their values and their priorities. And he knew the best of them. And he knew the worst of them. Us too. Jesus knows us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our values. He knows our priorities. Jesus knows the best of which we are capable and the worst of which we are capable. And Jesus knows our selfish natures and our giving gracious tendencies. Jesus knows us. And to me, personally, this is one of the most astonishing things about Christianity. Jesus came to earth. He lived among us. He came to know us and love us even with all our deficiencies. And still, still, Jesus loved us enough to save us. Jesus chose us. So yesterday, I was sitting with my father-in-law on his porch and we were watching basketball. And I had finished my glass of uh, soda and I was chewing on the ice. Do any of you do that? Well, stop it. Because I was chewing, as I was chewing on the ice, I heard a crack. And I thought it was uh, just a piece of ice breaking. Except it didn't feel like the piece of ice breaking. And for the rest of the evening, I had quite a toothache. And I woke up this morning hoping that it would all go away and it would all be fine. But guess what? It didn't. So tomorrow, I'll be calling the dentist and saying, I think I might have cracked a tooth. Even eating ice can be dangerous. <laughs> and with that, I invite you to the table. But I warn you, coming to this table can be dangerous. We call it Holy Communion. Communion is the gathering of, of us with God and with one another. And this meal, like every meal, has the potential of asking something of us that we may not want to give. Some time, some talent, some money, some interaction with folks that we've been hoping that we could ignore. In fact, folks that we have been ignoring. This table may require of us to step out of our comfort zone and do as Jesus did. This meal... This little bit of juice and little bit of bread can be dangerous for you because if you speak to the Lord in this process and if you listen to the Lord as you take your communion, you may hear the Lord say, oh, by the way, I got a little something I want you to do this week. Will you do it for me? The Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You are all invited to this love feast, the Lord's Supper. 
please pray with me. Dear Lord, let us always remember the gift that was given to us by your son, the sacrifice he made for eternal life. Please join me in the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, Our Father who, art who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as a reminder, there's offering plates at the back of the sanctuary. You can donate online. Or, um, but for offering here, I thought this one was a pretty good verse, I feel. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Do you join me in taking up our tithes and offerings? You know something curious? It's not even 1110 yet. But none of you have ever said to me, Tim, you need longer sermons. <laughs> Why is that? I think, uh, I, <laughs> I think you and I are careful <coughs> With our, with our invitations. Because if you invited me to do longer sermons, I'd probably do longer sermons. And then that might infringe a little bit on your Sunday morning plans. I don't think they'd be better sermons, by the way. Just longer. So we're careful with our invitations. We don't know exactly who we want to move into our sphere. We don't know who we want to invite into our home. We don't know who we want to invite to have some, some say in our values and our thinking. For Jesus to suggest that we openly invite people, any people, to accept him as Lord and Savior, that's a little bit risky, don't you think? You never know who might say, I, I want to be, I want to do, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Most of you did. We are careful with our invitations, but I don't know that Jesus is. He invites us all. And when the Spirit has moved us, when it is time, it's good to get an invitation. So you receive an invitation today. If this is the moment that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to come forward as we sing this song together. Will you stand with me? after the service so if you'd like to join us for lunch go downstairs and do so <coughs> there is one more Lenten devotional on the table out there so if you want it you better get it fast I have asked Don to uh, lead us in a benediction today so Pastor Don would you, you want to do it from there do you want this no. okay <laughs>
Amen.